Alrighty, g'day you bloody dickheads. It is me, the Vaping Bogan, and I have a very special guest today, Dr. Colin Mendelson. Uh, he is, I suppose, our equivalent to, uh, to, to the Americans. Um, who, who's, your, uh, who's your American equivalent, I suppose, Colin? Would it be... Um... <laughs> I have no idea. The Clive, the Clive Bates of Australia, I suppose. Well, that, that's a huge compliment. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you should all be familiar. If you've been watching me long enough, uh, I've talked about advocacy, not as much um, in recent times as uh, as maybe I used to. So that's, that's on me. But um, Colin has been working uh, tirelessly over the last, um, you know, 10 years in Australia uh, on the vaping side of things. And long before that on um, sort of quit smoking uh, campaigning. Um, so I'm just going to give you a quick little introduction, Colin, so people get an idea just sort of how um, qualified you are to be talking about this subject. Um, so Colin's, you know, spent 30 years, he obviously graduated um, back in 1976. Is that right, Colin? Yeah, Have I got that right? It. Yep. Yeah, spent 30 no, no, years no, no, working no. as... Yeah. <laughs> Back when uh, university was uh, was free, um, so uh, Colin spent thirty years as a, as a general practitioner working with uh, not just sort of helping people quit smoking, but in addiction in general. So uh, he's very qualified in in um, you know people's addiction, whether it be to uh, illicit drugs, um, you know like uh, like heroin um, and alcoholism, um, but also uh, working a lot with uh, with vaping and smokers. Um, so he's on here to talk to us about a whole range of things, mostly uh, his new book, which I think is a fantastic uh, sort of starting point for anybody that is looking to switch from smoking to vaping uh, and, and get off of the durries. So, um, so we're here to talk about Colin's new book, Stop Smoking, Start Vaping, but we're also going to talk about the broader advocacy side of things, um, both here in Australia uh, and obviously what's happening in New Zealand, which is some really good stuff. Um, which is great for them, and uh, unfortunately, we haven't followed suit. And obviously, a bit of reference to things that have done happened in the UK um, as well, another big pro vaping nation, um, and and obviously what's happened in America. So uh, we're going to go through sort of what the book's about and uh, some questions that I've got, and then um, if you've got questions for Colin, um, please fire them into the chat. A big shout out to uh, Shane Beekman once again taking care of my administration duties. Um, he will be uh, filing away your uh, your questions um, for a, a later moment in the video where we'll do a bit of a, a Q and A uh, with Colin, and he can answer anything that you've got um, because we might cover a bunch of it anyway um, throughout the video. But um, rather than trying to look at the chat and go to questions as they come up, we'll, we'll go to a, a little Q and A section. Um, so, Colin, thanks for coming on the show. Thank you so much, Sam. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I think it's I think it's brilliant what you've been doing with your own work, sort of independently, but also with Athra. Uh, if you guys are not familiar with uh, with Athra, um, they are, are you know for the because we're at a time slot where hopefully we've got a few Americans watching. But Athra is sort of our equivalent to CASA uh, in that it's an independent, uh, technically a, a charity. I think is 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 what it's yep. listed as, um, to basically, you know, fight over regulation, to disseminate real information and, and proper facts about vaping, uh, and try to campaign for, you know, uh, accessible um, nicotine replacement um, therapies like vaping. Um, and, uh, and so Colin's been working very, very hard with them over the, uh, over the last few years. So, um, if you want more information on sort of any of this stuff, um, Shane's put it in the chat there. You've got Athra. Uh, there's also links to Colin's own website, which is a, a real resource for, um, for vapors, but also uh, where you can pick up his new book. You can get it on places like Amazon, um, I understand, and your usual book places, but uh, it's a bit more expensive and there are some delays. So the best way for you to get it, uh, Colin says, is to hit his website and he will personally post it out to you. <laughs> That's right. No, and it will come very quickly that way. Coming yep. express post, it's, it's uh, certainly arrived before Christmas, long before. Awesome, awesome. Um, well, let's just kick things off simply with sort of why Why did you write the book? What is what is this aimed at? What have we got here? Yeah, look, as a doctor, my main priority is getting people to switch, well, to quit smoking. Uh, and of course, if people can quit altogether, that's great. And that's always what we prefer. But of course, many people can't, as you well know. So the, the book's aimed, it's aimed at smokers because 
you know, starting vaping is really overwhelming for, for new, new, new vapors. I mean, there's so many devices, there's so much to learn, and there's so much misinformation out there. So uh, the book provides the evidence for vaping and, and the how to, it takes you through the steps of, of getting started. But it also informs vapors. I think vapors are often, yeah, you know, they're also getting fed that misinformation. And people often say to them, look, yeah, you know, th that's much worse for you than smoking and you're going to get popcorn lung. And it gives them the evidence to be able to <laughs> understand what they're doing and how to come back against that. And, and finally, I was really fascinated by why there's so much opposition in Australia to vaping. And I wanted to explore that. And the book looks at why in Australia we're opposing vaping and, and making life hard for vapors when really we should be embracing it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's, um, it's, it's super frustrating as, uh, as a vapor. Um, and for most of our viewers here, when we see the government going completely in the opposite direction to what New Zealand's done, what the UK's done, um, you know, when you can go to a hospital in the UK and there's a, a vape store basically there, <laughs> there are bus stops with banners on them saying switch to vaping. Um, and our government instead wants to make it, you know, harder for the average person to access, you know, the vaping products and nicotine and all the rest of it. And it's, it's just, why is that? You know, I think most of us have our own ideas and, and we're going to get to some of that um, in a bit, the, uh, the corruption and the, um, and the double standards as to why the government doesn't embrace such a, a life saving product. Um, mm. it, it's very frustrating. And that's what I think, you know, I haven't read the whole book. It only arrived the other day, but you know, I had a good sort of flick through it and I've earmarked a few spots. We might try and um, sort of visit while we're, uh, while we're chatting. But it's not only a good guide to vapors um, or to smokers, should I say, to how to get into vaping. Um, it, it really breaks things down. And this is something that I think is mostly for a smoker. Um, but as a vapor, it's a really, really useful tool to have when you have those conversations with people and they say, oh, but it's just as bad for you as smoking or, you know, I've heard that it's super addictive and we don't know the effects of vaping, you know, this is all new and there's some really good chapters in here that talk about all of those, you know, ridiculous things because you, particularly this time of year, we're going to be going to family barbecues and, and Christmas functions and you're going to encounter those anti-vape questions and that propaganda talk that people <laughs> fire at you. Yeah. So there's some really good bits in here, um, I think, as well as also, you know, some stuff that maybe a lot of us don't realize, um, the cost of smoking in Australia. Um, as I said, I've got a lot of international viewers and, and some of them maybe aren't aware. Um, talk to us a little bit about just the cost of smoking in Australia versus the, the cost of vaping. Yeah, look, we've got the highest cigarette prices in the world. The government's been racking up the prices every year, you know, with the the, the basic argument has been, oh, this is going to help smokers to quit. But we've got to the point with eye-watering levels of, of uh, cigarette prices where people who are addicted just can't quit anyway. So we're just punishing often lower socioeconomic people with ridiculously high prices. And, and that's creating huge financial stress. But based on the prices that I've worked out, vaping is between 10 and 25% of the cost of smoking. Uh, depending on how you do it, you know, if you buy your own liquid and mix it, it's much cheaper than if you buy pre-filled pods. So there's a huge financial saving. And, and our latest national survey showed that actually cost is the main reason people are quitting these days. It used to be health, but cost is, a, is an issue and they want to quit, but of course they can't. And that's where vaping comes in. Yeah, I mean, it, it gets to that point where there's a, a flat point in, in the addiction reduction that price increases can achieve and at the exactly. end of it you just have pensioners who can't quit spending 75 yeah. percent of their income just on smoking and that's and this is, that's unfair this is exactly what this is exactly what um uh, jacinda ahern said yesterday she in her little talk um which was was publicized she said look we, we've gone as far as we can with cost they have the second highest prices in the world by the way she said, it's not working anymore. We have to try something different. Our traditional strategies aren't enough. And she gets it. And, and she's 
making it, well, we'll come back to New Zealand later, but she's making it harder to access cigarettes and easier to access vaping. We're doing the opposite. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You can still go to a, uh, any, any corner of Delhi, any service station um, and yeah. pick up <clears throat> cigarettes. But um, for, for vapors, um, we've now got to go and get a prescription. So I suppose maybe that's a, an interesting point to sort of jump onto is Australia's new policy on vaping and the restriction of nicotine access. Um, mm. Can you talk to us, you know, because again, I haven't, I've done a couple of videos leading up to the, the, the October 1st. I haven't actually done a video since the October 1st regulations came in. But for the people outside of Australia, what are we looking at now in, in, in Australia for nicotine access? Yeah, look, it's incredibly complex. You can't buy nicotine in Australia except through a pharmacy. Um, you can import it from overseas, but you have to have a prescription. Uh, if you try and import it without a prescription, the fine is up to $222,000. Mm. So you need to go to a doctor, but you need to find a doctor who will prescribe nicotine. There's about 400 listed on the TGA website, doctors who will prescribe nicotine out of 41,000. So very much, almost certainly your doctor won't prescribe it. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's about 120, I think, that are listed publicly. Uh, as being willing to write script, scripts, but we've got over 600,000 vapors. I mean, it's just ridiculous. Yeah. And the, prob the other problem is the doctors know very little about vaping. Yeah, well, that's had it. No they haven't training. had any training, have they? No, they no training. They've got very little knowledge and they're being given very negative messages about vaping. So they're, the College of GPs has specifically said to them, you don't have to prescribe nicotine if you don't think, if you don't want to, don't feel you yeah. have to. As a doctor, this is, and this is you know a question that I've had. As a doctor, you would be a better posi position to answer this. Why are doctors being fed? And it's not just from the TGA, but it's from other you know medical institutes in Australia, like you're saying the the the, the practitioners of society. Why are they spilling this rubbish? In, in my opinion, and I think you know you probably have the similar. Why are they being fed just utter bullshit? Yeah, look, I think there's this culture in Australia against vaping. I think it comes down to a, a number of things. I think the ideology uh, is, is a major issue. Like we've always approached smoking as an abstinence only issue. So, you know, anything to do with nicotine or anything that looks like smoking, that's got to go. And, yep. and they want to continue with that same traditional model. Whereas the United, in the United Kingdom, tobacco harm reduction has been, been um, promoted for years. So we've got this, you know, just quit, just say no option. Yeah. And so tobacco harm reduction is a whole new paradigm. But there's a whole lot of other issues behind that. There's vested interests. So organisations that have set up to fight tobacco have been, um, have, are threatened by vaping. I think they see this as something that challenges their relevance. Mm. And, 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 then, and then there's the, the financial side of it, the huge tobacco taxes, there's the moral objections to people using an addictive drug, especially if they enjoy it. Um, mm -hmm. There's all sorts of issues like that behind the scenes. And they don't come out and say that. They come out and say, oh, we're worried about the long-term health effects or we're worried about youth vaping. Whereas really the, the, the underlying, their justifications for the underlying concerns. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So they're sort of hiding behind these old, we don't know, and yes, oh, the children, yes. the children are yeah. going to start vaping. Um, and there's some really, there's a really interesting um, section that, that I was quite keen to, to sort of just talk about. And that is, you know, you talk about youth vaping. Um, where am I? Where have I got to find it now? Um, and, you know, the levels of, of youth vaping in Australia. Um, where is it? I did earmark it. <laughs> well, I can tell you, I can tell you, in the latest national survey, um, yeah. the, the number of youths vaping in the last year was less than 2%. Yeah. Um, and, and what we know, though, I mean, the numbers is one thing, but what we know is that most of that is just experimental uh, and it's short term. Most kids who start vaping are already smokers. Yep. And the evidence is increasingly showing that it's diverting kids from smoking. We saw that in New Zealand recently in the national uh, study there that in the last 12 months, the smoking rate in kids went down from 3% to 
to 1%, which is extraordinary. Mm. And the vaping rate rose. So kids are now taking up vaping as an experiment. They're not going on to smoking. And the public health benefits are huge. It's diverting kids who would have smoked away from smoking and taking kids who smoke onto vaping instead, which is a huge public health gain. Yeah, well, I mean, I started smoking when I was 15. I think I started pinching cigarettes from my parents when I was about 14, you know, here and there. And then by the time I was 16, I was properly addicted to cigarettes. I, I was, you know, smoking daily um, and then spent the next 10 years, you know, every day, nearly a pack or, or so of cigarettes. But it starts yeah. in the teens. Um, and exactly. so this idea of hiding behind like, oh, we don't want kids to start vaping. Well, what's the alternative? Kids are going to do one of the two. Yeah, exactly. And, and you know, we've got this problem with cheap disposables being sold illegally through convenience stores and tobacconists. And, you know, the government's doing nothing about that whatsoever. It's almost as if they can say, well, the kids are all vaping, so we've got to ban this vaping thing. But they're actually doing nothing. Yeah. The, 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 these products are available openly everywhere. So if they really were concerned about that, well, you know, there are solutions. Yeah, I hear about this all the time, a vape shop that's selling, you know, imported uh, disposables with nicotine in them, clearly advertised with nicotine in them, not even under the table stuff. It, it's not even, you know, sneaky stuff. It's it's there for kids to see and they're going in and they're buying these completely ready to go nicotine systems. I must say, not the vape shops in general. Very few vape no. shops do that. No, no, it's more the tobacconists, the convenience stores, and, and absolutely, it, stores. it's yeah. I should I should rephrase that. It's not the vape stores, um, and that's the big problem. Is it's the you know convenience stores, the the Seven Elevens, you know the dodgy yeah. Um, yeah. places where people get cigarettes from, um, and they're selling yeah. illegal nicotine stuff. How do you, how do you think the government could deal with that? Oh, look, they just need to enforce it. They just need to. I mean, it's so obvious where these products are being sold. They just need to go in there and say. If you do this again, you'll you lose your license. Uh, yep. it's, it's, it shouldn't be difficult. It's, it's, I mean, they're available on social media as well. That's going to be a bit harder. Just yep. needs a bit of enforcement. Yeah, and there's no enforcement. Having said that, I did hear recently that in Victoria, they have actually cracked down on a couple of places and issued you know yeah. several hundred thousand dollars worth of fines yeah. to places, um, which yeah, is so good to see. Are, there is, yes, there's a little, there is a little bit now, but, but it, it's a widespread problem. And, you know, the government is responding in, 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 in proportionately to the huge problem that they're making out of this. And look, one good thing about this, I've had a lot of patients who've been to the convenience stores, tried these nicotine disposable vapes, and have come to me, <clears throat> me and said, look, I'd like a prescription. I've found this is fantastic. So it's given people a chance to try these products, and then we can switch them across to something that's safer. Mm. So that's so how it has been useful. So how for, for an Aussie who's watching um, and needs to get themselves set up with, you know, nicotine, um, how is the best way for people to sort of do that at the moment? Yeah, yeah look, I think go to your GP is, 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 I think you should go to your GP and ask them. And I think we need to tell the GPs, they need to hear from their patients, okay, you've tried me with Champix, you've tried me with the patches. Get them, get them this book. I think this yeah, should not only go to yeah. the vapors yeah. and the smokers, but every GP should get a copy of this because this is a crash course for a doctor who doesn't know about vaping, who doesn't understand, it doesn't understand you know, what they should be prescribing and how they prescribe it because it's all in here. It's, it's yeah. easy for them. And I think if the, if the patients explain how well it's working for them, I think they're going to they're gonna listen. Uh, yeah. And they may not prescribe it, but uh, at least they'll start thinking about it. And I think we need, do need to get the doctors on side eventually. Yeah. But um, basically, to get a script, you need to go to a doctor who's willing to prescribe it. So on the Athra website, there's a list of doctors who are willing and, and readily prescribing nicotine. On the TGA website, there's a list of about 120 doctors by their address. So if there's one in your area, that doctor may be willing to prescribe nicotine for you. Um, but you know, the vast majority of the vapors aren't going to get nicotine scripts. And that's a lot of them are telling me that they're, yeah. they're, they're, um, you know, they're going to the black market, they're importing it without prescriptions. Um, Which is super you know, risky because it, it's a really big fine if yeah, you do get caught. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it, it's a criminal offence in Australia to have nicotine without a prescription. You can go to jail in some states. Now, that's not happening, 
but it's hanging over people's heads and they're worried about it. Yeah. So, so when you go to the doctor, the problem for the doctors again is the College of GPs is, 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 is kind of very ambivalent about vaping. So they're saying to doctors, um, if a patient comes and asks about nicotine, you can say no. So don't feel you have to say yes. Um, you should only use closed systems. They're saying the patient should come back every three months. Uh, you shouldn't be giving 100 milligrams per mil nicotine. Um, uh, you should only be referring patients to pharmacies for nicotine purchase. And there are some pharmacies that are now stocking it. But the, co the college is giving GPs very negative messages. So, you know, fewer and fewer are, in are willing to get involved. And you're not going to see a lot of pharmacies uh, actually even stocking nicotine because they have to get, is it a $1,200 license just to be able to stock it? Only, only in Tasmania. Oh, okay. So that's Tasmania, right. So yeah. once again, poor yeah. Tassie getting which has the highest smoke, Which has the highest smoking rate. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it makes a lot of sense. But, but um, the farm, there are pharmacists in Australia now which are stocking some commercial vape, and vape, vape pod products. And uh, there are some compounding pharmacies that will make up nicotine, like Brisbane Compounding Pharmacy, for example. They will make up, a doctor can write a script, they will make up the nicotine for you and ship it to you from within Australia. But uh, that's really only a very, very small market at the moment. And so if you're a vapor who's been importing their own nicotine, you know, prior to this change in the, in the scheduling and the, and the prescription model, um, are, are people able to still access nicotine the same way that they did before? What are they talking to their doctor about? Will, will these doctors allow them to continue doing what they have been doing? Well, the, the College of GPs says the doctor shouldn't import products from overseas. So the, the personal importation scheme, they're saying, well, don't, don't make sure these products are distributed by pharmacy. But, um, you know, you, you need to find a doctor who's willing to allow you to have a script for importation from overseas. I mean, the college right. is saying to doctors, write on the script, this is for pharmacy only. Okay. Um, I think that's ridiculous because they're worried about the quality of products. But look, we know the products that people get from New Zealand are all, you know, they're compliant with our standards and they're, you know, we're not having any problems with them. I don't see a problem with that myself. Yeah. Yeah, so picking the doctor from from an Arthur website, you're you're yeah. going to hopefully find someone that's going to get you a prescription that's going to allow you to, to keep importing. Yeah, and look, you know, and when I write <clears> a script, <throat> if someone's been a long term vapor, and they know what they're doing and they're mixing correctly and uh, they're having no problems, I'm quite happy to give <clears> them <throat> a, a script for twelve months, uh, and yeah. and a lot of the other doctors will make those decisions, whereas. The college guidelines, which are being read by people who really aren't that well informed just yet, they'll think, well, I'm only allowed to use this for pharmacy. So, you know, we have all those barriers. I mean, GPs, have, to be fair, have been getting all the negative messaging that everyone else is getting in Australia. Now, yeah, all the health organisations are saying to them, oh, this is a terrible thing and the kids are vaping and we don't know the long term effects and all that stuff. And they're getting their, their, their messaging from the media. They're not reading the medical research. And that's true all around, all around the world. The research shows that doctors read the, the headlines and that's their understanding of vaping. So and they're naturally negative. Exactly. Yeah. And so we've got to try and change that. Where do you, you know, uh, uh, sitting from the perspective that you have as a doctor and as a, you know, an advocate with Athra and everything else, uh, where do you see the regulations going in Australia? We've obviously heard recently that Mr. Greg Hunt will be stepping down, which I think is fantastic news. If we all raise a glass for Greg Hunt's, uh, you know, dismissal or uh, or um, you should I say retirement? Um, I was, I mean, but we know he's not the only problem and not the only yeah. barrier in Australian vaping. So, what? Where do you see things sort of going? Yeah, look, I, I am concerned about the future and I don't think we should. Um, the government has accepted vaping. Greg Hunt said, not on my watch. Well, actually, it has been allowed on his watch. Yeah. So um, <laughs> that's the first thing. But I think there'll be pushback uh, and the college is already pushing back. And we've seen this in other countries, like in Canada. They, you know, they, they said, yeah, we, we, we think vaping is great. And then they reduced the maximum nicotine to 20 milligrams per mil. Yeah. And now they're that's looking at banning flavours. And in the US, they were going to put huge taxes on vaping, and that's been knocked back just uh, overnight. 
So, I mean, there's a lot, there's going to be kickback for sure. There are still people who, who will say, well, um, okay, we'll, we'll accept some progress, but, you know, we want all these restrictions. The trouble is when you make concessions, it's never enough because they want to ban vaping. So they'll say, oh, well, we've got to stop flavours. So mm. you might all decide, okay, well, we'll stop flavours, at least we'll have vaping, but then there'll be something else and then there'll be something else. And, you know, I think we have to be very careful about the concessions we make. Yeah. And flavours are a big, you know, for me, you know, they keep me off of, off of cigarettes and you would have had a lot of experience with your, you know, um, patients. How many of those rely on flavours? Uh, look, I, I, you know, maybe one or two percent use no flavours. So, I mean, there are many issues there. One is like vaping. We need to make vaping attractive. We want people to switch to vaping and yeah. the flavours make it attractive. Some people have trouble with people enjoying vaping. And I think part of the resistance to vaping is, is about that. It should be a medical treatment, which you don't enjoy, which you get from the doctor and <laughs> the doctor knows all about it and gives you a medicine, which, you know, you have to have. Um, and you take for a while and you get better. It doesn't work that but Colin, way. Colin, pe people enjoy drinking alcohol and, and alcohol is, you know, far more dangerous than, than nicotine. How, how is this double standard of you can have flavoured yeah. alcohol, but I can't have a flavoured yeah. nicotine product and enjoy it? Yeah, and, and there are double standards. I mean, they use double standards because, you know, they don't have good arguments and they throw up all these reasons which don't apply to anything else. Like they'll say, for example, we need 30 years to prove these products are safe. But then uh, a COVID vaccine comes along after a few months and they say, oh, good, we'll use that now because yeah. people might die from COVID. But we need 30 years to prove that nicotine vaping products are okay. I mean, the double standards are everywhere to justify the fact that they really have no evidence. We don't have 30 years. We've got 21,000 Australians that will die every year yeah. from smoking-related yeah. illnesses. Yeah, that's right. We, we could save hundreds of thousands of lives if we get to work on this as soon as possible and make it make them more freely available. Um, and, and, and the other thing that worries me about the flavours is that it would destroy the vape industry. Yeah, and you and need that, that to be, make it accessible. That would be a disaster because they rely on the flavours to add to the nicotine. And if there are no flavours, there'll be no vape industry. And the vape industry is really important in, you know, basically it's a, it's a stop smoking service. People go to the vape shops and they get expert advice and uh, they, they can, it helps them to make that switch. What sort of regulations do you think that we should concede? Because I know there's always that chat about um, product packaging um, and availability. Do you think we should be having you know, vape products only available from vape stores? Do they need to be plain packaged or you know, do we allow some sort of, you know, I think... You know, having a, a, a blueberry on a blueberry flavour is, you, you kind of need that so people know what it is they're looking at. If you have everything plain packaging, it makes it all very just vanilla and you can't tell what something is. There's no differentiation. What sort of regulations? I know we were talking about not conceding too much by letting them take away flavours, etc. Because uh -huh. they'll just keep keep pulling and pulling and pulling until there's nothing left. But what sort of regulations do you think we could, you know, safely get behind and, and expect to, to have? Look, I think what they've done in New Zealand is pretty good. I think these should be consumer products and they should be available everywhere cigarettes are sold, Absolutely. not just vape shops. I mean, if a smoker's going into a tobacconist, they should be able to buy nicotine as an alternative because that's where the smokers will be. So they should be available freely. They should be regulated in proportion to their risk, which is only a tiny fraction of smoking. So I don't think they should be treated anything like tobacco. Yeah. So, you know, we need to make it as easy as possible for people to make the switch, not harder, which is what we're currently doing. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, there should be an age limit. Kids shouldn't be allowed to buy vapes and there should be proper, uh, um, uh, proper checking of ages and on websites, there can be third party verification. So I, I, th I think we do it with I alcohol. Think... We do it with cigarettes. You can buy alcohol online. Exactly. You can buy cigarettes online, and, except for South yeah. Australia. But in Victoria, New South Wales, you can buy them online. And why can't we apply those same checks and balances to to vapor products? Yeah. Well, again, it's another double standard. It's again, people have decided well, we don't want vaping, so we're going to restrict it in these ways, which which don't apply to other other forms of treatment, other forms of act, other activities. Yeah, and, and, and so what? Yeah. 
and and we were just talking about New Zealand, um, and I was having a bit of a read up on um, what they've just done. And you know, let, do you want to talk to us a, a little bit about uh, your recent post and what's happened in New Zealand? Because it's fantastic, sort of the results, the science is in, the statistics are in on what's yeah. happened. Yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. Tell the Aussies what's happened in New Zealand. Well, apparently, vaping in New Zealand is is, is quite a good idea. Um, Apparently, um, it's surprise, surprise. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a bit of a miracle, and it's only just across the Tasman. Um, and and you know, they get it. They basically have introduced a package of uh, strategies to make cigarettes less attractive uh, and less accessible. So they're going to reduce the number of cigarette outlets from eight thousand to less than five hundred. In Australia, you can buy cigarettes anywhere, twenty thousand outlets. Um, they're going to, and they're going to make vaping more accessible and, and, and allow people the, give people the incentive to make that switch. There's a whole range of other elements to that package, like reducing inequalities and improving smoking rates in Maori people. Um, and they're introducing what's called a vape. Um, it's called uh, a generation, a smoke free generation, which is another issue, but it's all part of a package. Uh, and, and I think the core of it is in promoting vaping. And they're already doing that. They've got a couple of excellent websites. They're encouraging people to vape, whereas the Australian government is discouraging them. And, you know, what's amazing is we're all using the same evidence. We yeah. have the evidence. They have the evidence. They've looked at it and said, obviously, we need to, if we're going to reach our target of a smoke-free society uh, in, by 2025, we have to do something serious. Our government's quite willing to just let this run slowly. They're doing very little to mm. support smokers and certainly very little to encourage vaping, nothing to encourage vaping. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, they're so addicted to that cigarette excise tax, but they could be flipping that, all that money they make from cigarette taxes that is yeah. essentially blood money. It's money from people yeah. that are dying. And if yeah. you suddenly embrace the vaping industry, You've got taxes, you've got revenue, you've got employment, all the rest of it. The benefits yeah, yeah. clearly balance. And I say that New Zealand's, so since their new nicotine sort of promotion and regulation, um, their smoking rates uh, have, is it dropped now below, well below Australia's? They're down to 10.9% or something of the population. Yeah. So what happened in New Zealand is they passed the legislation last year to allow vaping to be available as a consumer product. In the last 12 months, smoking rates have fallen 20%, which is unprecedented in any country. So people are taking up vaping and, and, and stopping smoking. In Australia, uh, over the previous six years of our national surveys, smoking fell by 19% in six years. Yeah. So it just goes to show you, sure, vaping's increased, but uh, with very small risks, but... Um, uh, smoking rates have dropped dramatically, and that's a, yeah. a huge step forward in public health. Yeah, and you know, we it comes back again to that prescription model, and they talk about the the, the Maori population having a high smoking rate, and they're trying to have, yeah. you know effectively hit that. Um, in Australia, we've got again our indigenous population high yeah. smoking rates. A prescription yeah. model is not going to make things more accessible for indigenous people that are maybe not near doctors and not near um, places they can access prescriptions. It's just too hard. And then they've got to have um, access to uh, a credit card and internet access and, and, and learn their way through this complex model of how to get started with vaping uh, with, while it's all being discouraged. So um, the Indigenous people are not going to, you know, I mean, the, the rate of Indigenous smoking has remained very high. And in fact, it's, the gap has not decreased over the last 20 years. And about 40% of Indigenous people smoke. I mean, it's a national tragedy, and yet we're not really targeting that. I mean, there are some government programs, but they're just not working because the rate is no is no different to what it, to the rest of the population compared to what it was before. Yeah, yeah, it's a huge problem. Um, and what do you, is the tobacco industry at all involved in any of this in New Zealand? And, and how has that in Australia affected our situation? Because to me, it doesn't, people go, oh, the tobacco industry is behind all this. And to me, it doesn't look like in Australia, the tobacco industry has really been a problem for vaping. It's the government. 
That's right. Look, this is an argument used to denigrate vaping. Basically, if you say the tobacco industry, everyone thinks, oh, the wicked tobacco, tobacco industry, they must be um, conspiring to make people smoke more. But in fact, the tobacco industry didn't invent vaping. They've only got, on, got involved because they had to, because they were losing all their customers and they're just adapting, like people are making electric cars now and using cleaner energy. Now, if you don't adapt, you and Kodak, look what happened to Kodak. If you don't adapt, <laughs> you, you, know, you, you lose your business. So yep. they've had, and, then, and I think if they make safer nicotine products, well, that's a good thing. But, you know, the argument is, well, if the tobacco industry is involved and it's something that looks like vaping, looks like smoking, well, we have to ban it. And as far as I'm concerned, uh, any product that's safer is, is good for public health. I don't care who makes it. Mm. Uh, and, and they're only making a very small part of it. Like globally, the tobacco industry only controls about 20% of the vapor market. So they've only got a very small role. And, you know, and they could contribute to, they could be part of the solution. And they are, like PMI, um, now 30% of its revenue is from reduced risk products. That's a really good thing. They're not gonna stop making cigarettes, but if they can shift towards making easy tobacco and vaping products, well, that's, that's, you know, that's a big win for everyone. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so what we might do is that before we jump into questions, is there is there any topics or questions that you personally either haven't answered or, or covered? And then we might go to the uh, go to the people. Um, let's have a look. I, I, um, I, I will say that people should completely stop smoking if to get the full benefit from vaping. So we yeah. know that even one or two cigarettes a day is actually very harmful. Like one cigarette a day is the equivalent of half a packet of cigarettes in giving you a heart attack and it reduces your mortality. So a lot of people dual use, I think people should try and get off the dual use as soon as they can. Right. Um, and, and having a cigarette or two a day is still it's much better, but still a big problem. And, and I think that's something we should be pushing for. And um, the other thing I wanted to mention was nicotine. Um, you know, there's all this misinformation yeah. about nicotine. That's a good point. Is nicotine, you know, am I going to die from using nicotine for the rest of my life? What, what, what? <laughs> I know no, I'm not, well, but let's, let's, let's put some information out there for the people. What's the position yeah. of nicotine in all of this? How does that relate to the health worries? Yeah, look, nicotine is addictive uh, in cigarettes, uh, but much less addictive in vaping. And we know that because there's other chemicals in cigarettes that make it more addictive. Yeah. Um, but, you know, on its own, it's relatively benign. And that's, you know, that's been recognised by the Public Health England, the Royal College of Physicians, a whole range of organisations have said, look, in the doses we're using, it's relatively benign. It does have minor health effects puts your blood pressure up briefly, your, your pulse up briefly, it can increase your sugar, it can affect wound healing. But it's it's only a very minor, it's not what causes all the health effects of smoking. Yeah. So what causes the health effects? What causes the cancer, the heart disease, the lung disease is not nicotine. So, and, and even in young people, you know, there's this argument, oh, but young people will get brain damage by nicotine if their mother smokes or if they smoke. But um, there's no evidence for that. Now, the evidence for that is only from rodent, rodent studies. Right. So we have no evidence that, that nicotine harms the adolescent brain. And if, we, if it did, we'd expect to see, of all the millions of people who've smoked, we'd expect to see later in life. But yeah, they, I was smoking so and, much when I was a teenager. Why am I not brain dead? <laughs> Why are not all the smokers? Right. Most of us started as teenagers. How are we all you know, not, not absolutely stuffed? And, and Einstein and Freud, I mean, there are so many classic examples of people with you know, top, top, top IQs who, who, who smoked when they were young. And there's no evidence epidemiologically when you look at those smokers who have quit compared to or, who, or, or have quit compared to people who didn't smoke. So mm. it, it's a false argument. And I think it's used to, again, to, to undermine vaping and to, you know, to promote this youth vaping. Uh, panic that we're seeing. 
Yeah. All right. Well, um, we might jump on over to a few questions from uh, from the viewers. Um, Mike Haynes is asking, Colin, um, do you think what is happening in the UK will help Aussie vapors? Well, um, the trouble with that, is, the trouble is that our authorities tend to refer to the, the, the situation in the US, which has been handled very badly. Yeah. But, um, um, you know, the, the authorities also say, well, you know, they're all wrong. The UK and New Zealand are all wrong. We're the only ones that are right and will be proven in, in, yeah. in years to come. And again, this is all about, you know, you, it just doesn't make sense. It, it's just about we don't believe in it, so we're going to say, well, this is wrong. And I think I think we will get some advantage from New Zealand because they're just across the Tasman. They're very similar to Australia. They've got the same tobacco control laws. And 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 we're in kind of in a like in a kind of like randomized controlled trial. So New Zealand has got the active component, which is the vaping. We've got the dummy component of the randomized control <laughs> trial. And we'll see the results. We'll see the results. And, 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 and there's only so long we can ignore that. Yeah. And that's what's happening in the UK. In New Zealand, the vaping, the smoking rate's now 10.9%. In the US, it's 12.1%. Uh, in the UK, it's 12.1%. The US, 12.4%. The last measure in Australia was 147 I mean, all these countries are falling much faster in their smoking rates than Australia, and all those countries have ready access to vaping. And it might not sound like a huge amount, sort of 4 or 5% difference, but when you put that against the population, you're talking hundreds of thousands of people. <clears throat> yeah. Which, is, which yeah. is a huge amount of lives. That's right, and, and it's only going to, <clears throat> to get worse unless we catch up. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, Steve Fogarty asks, Colin, if I send you a vaping bogan t-shirt, will you wear it? <laughs> <laughs> yes, Steve, that would be very nice. Thanks. Yes, I know, Steve. I, we'll I, sort I, that I, out, Colin. We'll I'll sort that out. <laughs> um, on to more uh, serious questions. Uh, Live Lounge Liquids uh, ask, what's the financial impact of prescribing nicotine versus buying through other methods? Yeah, look, um... Prescribing, well, you have to have it prescribed to have yeah, it legally. Think, yeah. So I'm a little bit unclear about what he means, but um, I think if you get it through the pharmacies, it's going to cost you more. I mean, you won't have to import it, but there's going to be the visits to the doctor and the college wants that every three months. Um, the pharmacies have significant markups and, of course, a much smaller range. And I think that's and what I he's asking, that, yeah, is... Is importing yourself versus this pharmacy yeah, pharmacy yeah. system, you know, it's going to be a lot more expensive, isn't it? It is, and we shouldn't have to import it. I think it should be available just like tobacco products are in Australia, and, and is easily accessible. Just legalise the nicotine in the first place, and and exactly. don't make it a pharmacy model. Don't make it a prescription model. Just make it accessible yeah. and and sold to adults. The point is, it's not a medicine. It's not a medicine. It should be managed by the ACCC and it should be just regulated by them. They're good at regulating products of safety and effectiveness. And in other countries, that's, it is regulated as a consumer product, whereas our TGA has been given control over vaping and, and they, you know, to them, are, um, you know, if you've got a hammer, everything's a nail. And so they see this as a medicine and, and, and it, therefore it's required to meet medicine standards. And that's one of the problems that doctors have. They're being asked to prescribe these products which have not met medicine standards and they shouldn't have to. And they're yep. saying, well, we're a bit worried about this because we're being asked to prescribe something and we'll be responsible if there is a problem. And of course there are so few problems. Um, whereas in fact, I think doctors have an ethical obligation to prescribe the safer product. You know, yep. if patients can't quit, and the doctor, and we know that vaping is the most effective quitting treatment or alternative to smoking. Yeah. And the doctor doesn't prescribe it. Well, I, I think there's an ethical issue there. You know, the doctor's responsibility is what's in the best interest of this patient in front of me. Just last month, there was a review by the National Institute of Health Research in the UK, and they did this complex network meta-analysis looking at all the trials of all the stop smoking treatments. And they found that vaping was the most effective treatment, more than Champix, 
more than NRT. But doctors only know yeah. about champions <clears throat> NRT. And so they think, well, the patient has come along uh, wanting to vape, well, we should try the Champix at NRT again, which of course they've tried before, and, and which are less effective, uh, and, and, and which just delay the patient's quitting uh, again and again. And that was a bit in the book that I, I sort of forgot to get to, and that was um, you talk about how much more effective vaping is as a quitting aid, and, and you obviously made the, you know, the claim based on evidence that vaping is the most effective quit aid, and there's evidence yeah. to now show that. There is. The, the, the study from the UK of, of 117 trials comparing them made that conclusion. And the randomised controlled trials have shown when you give half the people vaping and half the people uh, an alternative, vaping's 50 to 100% more effective. Yeah. But out in the real world, um, you know, there are other what are called observational studies where you follow a group of people doing one or the other, population studies where you look at the people who have tried vaping against those who haven't, uh, and, and other kinds of studies. And if you bring all those studies together, which is called triangulation, which is the proper way to make an assessment of a, a real world product use, then we, we know that vaping is working much better than all the other treatments. Out in the real world, even without the doctors, especially without the doctors, it's working. Yeah. Uh, and the doctors are actually getting in the way. And I think the government needs to get out of the way and let people uh, quit in, 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 in a way that, that clearly is working. Yeah, there's an interesting question from uh, Thick, Thick Filler. <laughs> interesting name yeah. there. Uh, I have a question. Are there superior benefits to vaping with zero milligram nicotine vape liquids rather than actual levels of nicotine? Yeah, look, that is a, a bit of a thick question. Um, <laughs> there's two parts. <laughs> there's two parts to vape. There's two parts to uh, nicotine dependence uh, and uh, in from vaping and smoking. One is the nicotine. Now, people biologically, physically need the nicotine. I mean, and the other is this, this. and the other is this. And the most common thing that patients say to me is, "Look, I tried all those things, and yeah, they worked for a while, but I just really miss this. I it's really miss that feeling of the smoke in my throat." the ritual, the habit, when people went out for a work break. I had a patient recently who said he took up smoking because everyone else was going out for a smoking break and he had yeah. to keep working. And, yeah, and they were out there discussing all the, <laughs> all, the, all the interesting people were outside and, and he took up smoking so he could join them. Um, uh, yeah, so you, you need that ritual is really important and vaping is the only thing that does that. Yeah. Uh, and an interesting question here from uh, Jake White. Um, once I have a prescription, can I use the nicotine I already have stocked up on or do I have to buy from a chemist? I guess that comes down to what kind of prescription it is. But I guess if you've got an import prescription, can you continue to use the stuff that you've got? Yes, you can. So you have to have a prescription to possess nicotine legally in Australia. So whether you're importing or not, you have to have a prescription so that uh, if, if, if you approach, you can say, yeah, here's my prescription, it's legal, what I'm possessing is legal. Yeah. Um, because the, you know, in, this, in every state there are fines up to $30,000 for possessing nicotine without a prescription. There's penalties of jail up to two years uh, and both together. Um, so, yes, you should have a script anyway, but if you want to import it, then you, you, there are fines of up to $222,000. So certainly for importing. Uh, it's very important to have a prescription. And if you do have a prescription, it has to match what you're importing. So if it's yep. intercepted by the Border Force, they'll look at the script that's in the box and they'll check that the strength and the volume of what you're importing matches the prescription. So you can't order 500 mils of 100 milligram per mil nicotine if the script says 100 mils. Yeah. And so... Um... Do you have any sort of, um, can you explain it all for people that have got their, or they're going to get their prescription to say import, let's say they get their prescription and continue importing it. How are the vape sh shops in New Zealand managing this, you know, proving prescription, you know, sort of thing? Yeah. How is it sort of working? Yeah. So look, um, they're all very aware of it, of course. Uh, there are some vape shops that are taking responsibility for this and they're saying, look, we're not going to provide you with nicotine products unless you have a prescription. 
And, mm-hmm. and, and look, there's an argument there. They want to be seen to be doing it properly and they want to s- show that, you know, regulation and compliance works and uh, I think that I can see the argument for that. Other vape shops say um, is upload your script, but that's up to you. I will okay. send it out anyway, but right. that is putting the, the customer at risk and, you know, that's something to keep in mind. You may so they will, to... provide, they will provide these products. They will provide the products without the prescription, many of them, prescriptions, yep. but uh, you should upload the script if you can. And that'll just speed up the process, I suppose, that if Border Force do pick it up, they go, yep, this is all fine, off it goes. Otherwise, you may be delayed because you've got to then provide your script to the Border Force and, and then wait for them to... Well, actually, the latest, uh, my, the latest word I've heard is that if the Border Force intercepts your parcel and it doesn't have a script, they destroy it. So supplying a script after the event uh, is not regarded as satisfactory. No, right. and, and you are at risk of fine. So look, they're not yet uh, enforcing that, but I think they're giving us a bit of a grace period. But I think in time that will be a potential Just risk. And that's play it safe. In, upload your script when you when you make your purchase, and that yeah. way you you're sort of covered. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, um, and this is a good one here from Live Lounge Liquids again. Um, is the what kind of impact is there on uh, as we you know our borders are now starting to open? Although uh, I'm not sure if they closed again. I think they closed them again, but eventually going to open again. Uh, if you're a traveller, say from outside Australia coming in, uh, yeah. are you going to need to have a script to come to Australia and continue to vape? Well, you're going to need a script to bring nicotine into Australia. Yeah. So there's what's called the traveller's exemption. Um, right. which means you can bring in up to three months supply at, uh, for personal use, but you have to have a script from an Australian doctor. Okay. So if you're, if you're in the UK, and I've had a few calls from the UK saying, look, I'm coming to Australia, um, you know, do I need a prescription? And yes, you do. And, and, you know, we can email scripts to people coming to Australia, just like they live in Australia, but they have to have that. They're going to go through customs. Mm. Yeah, it's a it's a tricky one because that really does, you know, you, you've got to organise your visas and all the rest of it, and now you've got to what contact an Australian doctor and get a prescription, to, yeah. so that you can vape on your holiday here in Australia, which is just right. just crazy. I mean, there have been concerns raised about uh, the the issue of, of tourism in Australia, and and the, you know, a lot of vapers have said, I'm not going to bother going through that, and that's understandable. And if it's hard to find a, a, a doctor in Australia who provide nicotine. Uh, I think if you're overseas, you, you may find it even harder. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. We got a hard enough job here in Australia, let alone, you know, if you're yes. based in the UK and everything else. So yeah, it's a ridiculous yeah. system. Um, it's just ridiculous. <laughs> um, I think that's all the questions that we've had so far. So if you've got any more guys, get them in. Um, otherwise, I guess I'll just hand it back to you, Colin, in terms of what, um, what can us as Australians, or I suppose, you know, vapors globally, but particularly for us as Australians, what can we be doing uh, as advocates to push the government towards the New Zealand model? Or are we just waiting for them to see the evidence and then maybe hopefully change things? What can we be doing? I wouldn't be waiting. No, Um, exactly. (laughs) Yeah, I think advocacy is really important. I think this is a political decision, you know, mm. the, the, it's going to be, the decision's going to be made in parliament, in federal parliament, or in maybe one of the state parliaments first. Uh, if a state parliament makes the decision, and that involves them saying in our state, nicotine's not a, an S4 prescription product, it's a consumer product, and therefore people can sell it and buy it in our state, and federally it'll be in Australia. Um, so... We need to put pressure on the politicians. They need to, politicians' priority is the next election. Yeah, which and is they coming need to understand up. That, which is coming up. They need to, under, and, and there's a, a very good camp, a very good case for campaigning in, in uh, marginal seats and putting the pressure on politicians. Now, I don't know if that's going to change the policy in the short term, but the more they realise that there's 3,500 vapors roughly in each federal electorate, if yeah. each of those vapors went to visit their MP, took along a few friends who vape, and, and Colin's or, or book, give, give this take guys. If yeah, you yeah, want to yeah, do yeah. a bit of charity this Christmas, buy yeah, this yeah, book yeah. and go and Send drop it, it off to your local member and tell them, hey, read this and think about what you're doing because it's going to affect my decision on who to vote. 
Yeah, exactly. I think I think you've got to make that clear because once there's enough of a critical mass, politicians will take notice. Uh, there's yeah. got to be votes in there. It, it's much there's much less risk at the moment for them to say, well, we're going to allow. There's more risk to say we're going to allow vaping nicotine, simply because there's there'll be a huge kickback from the Cancer Council, the Heart Foundation, the AMA, and all the usual suspects, uh, and and they have to back backpedal on their decision. If there's enough voters pushing them, then you know th- they'll have no choice. That, that you know they'll be voted out if they don't follow mm. through. And I might say, in the coalition, there is a lot of support for vaping. Uh, it's come up in the party room, and Greg Hunt has been the main barrier. And you know there is the potential that if the Liberal Party gets in, the coalition gets in, we we, we know the National Party is strongly in support of vaping. Um, Barnaby's a smoker, his wife, his partner is a vapor, uh, and there's almost universal support there. Mm. But um, uh, in the in the in the and in the Liberal Party room, there are a lot of supporters. Um, Holly Hughes, of course, is is well known she's, for her she's support. She's been great. She's been fantastic. Um, but um, there there is broad support, and but in the Labor Party, unfortunately. The, the, the support is, is fairly negative. Tanya Plibersek, we've been to visit her, and she said, oh, no, this is all a tobacco company uh, conspiracy <laughs> to make young, <laughs> to, to hook young people. And she's been quite public about that. She published that, uh, published that, uh, uh, that, uh, that argument. It's a, pub, it's a conspiracy to get young people smoking and to get more people, adults smoking. Um, you know, th- th- they're just so uninformed. Uh, and, and they talk about all the arguments that are raised about poisoning in children and uh, the long-term health risks. And, and unfortunately, they are. we've been to visit the Shadow Minister for Health, who's, again, well, when it was Chris Bowen, he was very opposed. Mark Butler, I think, is more, more in favour, but still opposed. But it's a political issue. It, yeah. it comes down to there's enough support from their electorate, and they're going to get voted out. I think that's going to make a difference. And that's why I think... Vapors need to advocate. They need to. We need to start putting the pressure on because it's it's been hard the last four years. It's hard when elections just happen because they know they're safe, you know, yeah. you know, and, and the way that they play musical chairs with the politicians these days, you know, yeah. they're probably going to be moved around or in and out before the next election anyway. Yeah. So now that we've yeah. got one coming up, now's the time, guys and, and and girls, to be pushing back on the pressure, you know, putting the pressure yeah. back on these politicians because, you know, in the next four months five months we're going to be having another election and, and these guys need to feel that um that pressure from us vapors um yeah, yeah. and we saw it with the with the nicotine laws they they delayed the nicotine laws because of the backlash they were going to ban uh, vaping yeah. completely and they only brought in the prescription because we said fuck that there's no way you're doing this and we had you know some more high profile sort of celebrity type vapors there's a few comedians and and that that you know, said, you know, uh, you can't, you don't take my bloody vape away. You, this is, this is ridiculous. And it, it worked. It, obviously, we still ended up with this prescription model, but it could have been worse. It could um, have been a lot worse. Yeah. And I, I think vapors, vapors need to be heard. They need to tell us, to share their stories with people. We need to win public support and have a mass movement. Mm. Uh, and, and those sorts of mass movements work. Things like um, assisted dying, you know, it, the numbers build and state by state it's being introduced and that that, yep. that could happen with vaping um and they need to tell their mps tell their doctors about their personal stories write to newspapers uh respond to the radio uh call, call shows and tell their stories so that that the message is out there this isn't just a fringe group the, mm. the, the, this is a serious issue which is uh, helping lots of people and it's life-saving I would challenge everybody who's got a spare, you know, what is if they buy it directly from you, Colin, what is the book going to cost them? Yeah, the retail price is thirty four ninety five. Um, that's what I charge, and and, and then a there's bottle a bottle of juice. It's 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 a bit over a bottle of juice. All right, so you know, go a little slower on on your on your vaping and buy Colin's book for for a little bit more than the price of a, of a bottle of juice, or it's a, it's a hundred mil bottle of juice. And I would take this to your doctor. I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna have a bit more of a read of it, but I don't need this for me. I, I know what's going on, so I'm gonna give this to my doctor next time I'm in there because I asked him about vaping, and you know, he's he's not a, a an old doctor, um, but he still had no idea. You know, he's probably not much older than me, and he had no idea about vaping. 
Um, yeah. And I think if we can get everybody to get these into the hands of doctors, then we're going to have a better chance at getting things, you know, changed. Less than, of, less, less than the cost of pack, a pack of the cigarettes. Uh, exactly. It's less than a packet of cigarettes yeah. in Australia for those outside of Australia. A pack of smokes will cost you more than, than, uh, than this book. Um, it's ridiculous. So, no, I think if we can get this, and this is a fantastic tool for the smokers, um, but also just for, you know, the ill-informed general public and, and general practitioners. Yeah. And look, there's some inspiring testimonials in there. I've had some wonderful vapors. Yeah, I was who reading those. Willing to tell their story. I mean, Holly Hughes tells her story. And Joe Hildebrand, one of our well-known journalists. Um, Fiona Patton, who's an MP from... Victoria, <clears throat> and a great advocate for vaping, is, is very supportive. Uh, Robert Richter, the QC from Melbourne, uh, has been very, very, uh, very openly supportive of harm reduction. But a lot of regular people who are passionate and willing to be, to be telling their stories, and that's what vapors need to be doing, I think, showing that real people uh, are, are taking advantage of this life-saving technology. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, it's and, a really, and, and, really and, uh, well put together sort of information. It's, it's very Thank well. Thank you. And we were, we were discussing before the um, inclusion of Steve Rayberg at Le Legion Vapes. And I apologise <laughs> that you went involved. I, so. I can understand that. If people, if people get this and they see Steve in there and they go, why isn't the Bogan in this book? Well, Steve's got a, a really, um, a much more um, clean way of delivering his information. Um, I have, and that's why if anyone's wondering why I haven't had a beer today, because normally when I do a live video, I, I usually, as you know, Colin, have a, have a beer, but I thought getting, uh, uh the doctor of, of, um, you know, addiction, uh, you know, control on and, and cracking a beer at 10 30 in the morning probably isn't the right message. <laughs> so, um, for those that, that are missing my beer segment, uh, I do have my usual beer advent calendar, my daily, uh, lead up to Christmas. So, uh, I'll be cracking into that. Uh, shortly after I finish here with Colin. So you'll still get your daily dose of me uh, having a craft beer. But um, there are more healthy and, uh, and important issues to discuss. So I thought I'd leave that out. And I can understand, again, why Colin didn't put me in the book. Because if you're a brand new vapor or you're a smoker, you probably want to check out Steve's channel before you, uh, you see me um, calling you dickhead and, and <laughs> dropping the F-bomb every two minutes. Well, I have to say, um, Sam, that you're definitely in the book. Your channel is definitely recommended. Although I do give it a language warning to people yeah. um, who, have, who are sensitive to um, the language that may be occasionally uh, mentioned. But um, yeah. obviously the, the information is, is fabulous. No, I think what you've done here is fantastic. Um, I don't know whether I've got a whole lot more to ask you. Is there any final words that you have for, uh, for the people? And we might wrap it up. Yeah, look, um, I, 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 I just think... There's so much misinformation out there, and I think the media really laps it up. The media, the alarming headlines, the media take a very negative focus. They don't often do balanced articles. Sometimes they do great articles, but they're often not balanced. They're sensational. They pick up these single case studies, and, and I think people are really confused about vaping. I think one thing I try and do in the book is give the real evidence. And the, the book quotes over 400 scientific studies. Yeah. So, you know, it is, about, it is about the evidence, not about what you read in the media. What you read in the media is very misleading. So uh, yeah, I it's think all once we up, get the evidence out there, it's not anecdotal. I mean, there's plenty of, of testimonials and stuff, but the the references is long and, and you know legitimately researched and, and backed up with with the evidence. As Nick, Mr. Grim Green, always says, you know, the science has shown um, clearly that this is a far better yeah. alternative, and it's the best weapon we have, and we need to be pushing that. And we do say, I uh, just just on that point, Nick uh, Sam, what we do say is that um, uh, vapors should try and quit smoking somewhere down the track if they can. I mean, obviously there is, is some small risk and we, as a doctor, I always say to people, look, there may be problems in the long term we don't know. We think they're gonna be very small, but clearly there's nothing as good as fresh air. So there is always that yeah. message to quit smoke, quit vaping if you can, but if there's any risk of going back to smoking then, and if you're not confident, 
that you will quit then of course yeah you should, if, you? if you're a, if you're a never quitter you know and, and i kind of put myself in that category that you know if i don't have that and i think for me it's that ritual thing you know if i was to yeah. go to the yeah. pub and have a beer I, you know if i didn't have my vape i would be very tempted to yeah. um to just go straight back to what i did before yeah the ritual is very powerful and and mm -hmm. vaping is the only way to deal with that in, in a safe way yeah yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, thank you so much, uh, Colin, for coming on. Um, ladies and gentlemen, thank, thank you for tuning in. It's been a really informative um, and educational chat. I think there's a, a lot of great information there. And uh, as I said a couple of times already, you get the book. It's available on your usual outlets like Amazon and things like that. Otherwise, you can go directly to Colin's website, which is in the description and also in the chat. Um, if you need your nicotine prescriptions, uh, head to athra.org.au and you can find a, a whole resource of information there as well as Colin's own website. Um, and uh, and just get the information out there, guys. And over the next few months, let's put the pressure on the polys. Absolutely. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, Colin, and uh, catch you. you later, dickheads. Thank you, Sam. No